If I said 73 OM and thanks for the QSO, would you have any idea what I meant? Well, no worries. Stick with us for this video and we'll teach you all the ham radio jargon you need to sound like an expert on the air. KN4 NEH, this is Hi, I'm Jim N4BFR, one of the instructors at Ham Radio Prep, here to Elmer you to sort out some of the inside terms amateur radio operators use while communicating. We are on a mission to educate and inspire the next generation of amateur radio operators. So if this is your first time watching our videos, be sure to like and subscribe so you can get more great free videos like this one. Let's start with that term Elmer. An Elmer in ham radio is someone who mentors you on a topic. You can have many different Elmers. One may help you with Morse code, while another is good at antennas. Now every hobby seems to have its own jargon. My wife likes to crochet and I can't tell you the difference between a stitch holder and a slip stitch, but I'm sure she could explain it. Ham radio's jargon has much of its roots in telegraphy and Morse code. Back in the 1850s, short codes were introduced to speed up Morse messages, but I'll get to that in a few minutes. I won't cover all the little terms you might hear, but we'll get the ones that might confuse beginners. Let's start with the slang that refers to ham radio equipment. It's all just radio, right? Well, not really. The terms radio, rig, or unit are overarching terms for a device that can send or receive an RF, that's radio frequency, signal. When you dive down into types, you could have a receiver, which is used just for listening to signals, or a transmitter, which is used for sending signals. Some types of receivers you might see include ones focused on shortwave, a transistor radio is a kind of receiver, and so is a modern scanner that can listen to many parts of the band. You might see dedicated transmitters like this one in vehicles to track their position. This is an APRS transmitter. Another might be a transmit-only beacon that sends out HF signals to track propagation. Back in the day, hams used equipment in pairs, a match receiver and transmitter that could send voice or morse over the shortwave bands. Today, most radios combine the transmitter or receiver into one device, so those two names have been blended into the terms transceiver. These days, a transceiver can be as big as a box of sneakers or as small as a deck of cards, depending on the band. We call these handheld radios walkie-talkies or HTs for handy-talkies, which was Motorola's brand name for handhelds back in the day. While it's not required any longer, many hams still embrace operating with Morse code because of its challenge and the distance you can get your signal with lower power. You send your code with a Morse code key, and there are several types. A straight key probably reminds you of what those 1850 telegraph operators use. You send dots or dashes depending on how long you hold it down. A keyer or paddle uses logic in the radio to send a dot when you swipe in one direction and a dash when you swipe in the other. Here's some fun with a beautiful brass paddle. To practice your Morse code away from the radio, you would use a sounder, which is a device that can create dots and dashes from your key without sending them over the air. Your radio and key connect up via cable to an antenna to send your signal. Let's break those two down quickly. There are different types of cable used. The most popular is called coaxial cable, or coax for short. Similar to what your cable TV might use with some size and electrical differences. It carries the radio signal your transceiver generates to your antenna. The antenna is the wire or metal device that turns the signal from electrical energy on the wire to RF energy over the air. You may hear terms like dipole, vertical, and Yagi related to antennas. Those are different designs that can be applied based on several factors. So let's talk about some of the jargon you might hear as you listen to ham radio signals over Morse code, voice, or even digital transmissions. We'll start with trying to find someone to talk to, 
And that usually means calling CQ. In ham terms, CQ means I seek you. Or, hey, I'm looking for someone to communicate with over here. Hams would include their call sign and some other basic information in their transmission. For example, I might say, CQ, CQ, this is N4BFR doing parts on the air at part K3378, standing by for a call. It all depends on the situation. When someone comes back to me, until I know them better, I'll probably refer to them as OM or YL. In ham radio, every guy is an old man and every woman is a young lady. Maybe I'm calling for contacts and intentionally looking for someone distant from me. I would then call CQDX in that case, with the DX standing for distant. In most cases, when someone says DX, they mean outside your current country. To go along with that, the DXCC award is what you get for confirmed contacts with 100 countries. The CC stands for Century Club. While we're in the middle of a contact, we're having a QSO or QSO which just means a conversation with two or more hams. If I wanted to confirm I talked with another ham at a specific time, I would send them a QSL card, which documents our discussion by mail. QSL is also the ham version of OK or even 10-4. Did you notice that both of these codes start with the letter Q? Communicators standardized on a set of codes that start with that letter and the international regulatory body does not give any country call signs that start with the letter Q, making them really stand out on the air. Let's quickly touch on a few other Q codes. QRP means you're using low power, usually less than 5 watts on Morse or 10 watts on voice. QTH is where you live or where you are at the moment. So if you're on the beach in California, you might say, my QTH is near San Diego. QSY is the term for changing frequencies. If you're trying to have a conversation on a noisy part of the band, you'd communicate, let's QSY to the Dallas repeater. It's too noisy for simplex. Speaking of noise, QRM and QRN are the Q codes for noise related issues. The difference is that the M is for man-made noise and N is for natural. That sounds like this. I think your car's alternator is causing some QRM on your signal. Or, the lightning storm is causing QRN across the bands today. If the lightning is close, you probably want to go QRT, which means shutting down your station. If you're active on Morse code, you'll hear more Q codes over time. But these are the most popular you may hear on voice or see in your digital communications. Back at the start of this video, we mentioned an 1850 short code for telegraphers. Those were standardized in something called the 92 code by Western Union. These were usually one or two digit numbers that would replace longer terms. So instead of sending, what's the weather, you just send 14 in Morse. Two of those codes have stood the test of time in amateur radio, coming over into Morse code in the early days and being used by voice today. They are 73 and 88. Both are melodic sounding and once you hear them on Morse, you'll remember them for a while. 73 is best regards or goodbye. We usually use it to end a contact. I might say, Jack, thanks for the contact, 73 to you as a way to tell him I'm ready to move on. Oh, and if you hear 72 instead of 73, that's a QRP operator who cares enough to send the very least. 88 is affectionate. That's love and kisses, which was probably included in messages more than it was shared from operator to operator. Let's wrap this up with one you hope to never hear in earnest. That's SOS. It's this Morse code distress signal of three dots, three dashes, and three dots. The concept that makes it save our ship came later. It's really just a distinctive sounding group of code made to get operators attention. It was continuing to be standardized internationally in the 1910s, so when it hit the iceberg, the Titanic sent both SOS and CQD as distress signals. CQD at the time stood for Come Quick Danger. 
If you got all that down, you're probably ready to start making a couple ham radio QSOs, and for that, you need a license. The place to get your license training is hamradioprep.com. We have a passion for training people to pass their FCC exams, and over 60,000 people have gotten licenses thanks to our course. Lessons include instructor-led videos on all the elements of the exam, along with practice tests, quizzes, and exercises to help you understand the material. Visit us at hamradioprep.com to get started. That means it's time for this video to go QRT. I'm Jim N4BFR, 73 from me and all of my friends at Ham Radio Prep. Now that I'm done Elmering, I'm taking my HT to my QTH so I can tell my wife 88.